I am so excited to talk to you all today about what is a really, really difficult topic, but one that is very, very interesting and relevant to what we've been talking about these past few weeks, which is the art of the Mexican muralists. Now let's put this all into its historical context. Between 1910 and 1920 was a period of civil war and armed conflict in Mexico. Um, and it ended in 1920 with a new constitution um, led by president who was General Obregón and new land and labor reform. So there was an almost 11 year civil war with about a million lives lost. After the new government was founded, the government turned to the arts to try to create a sort of propaganda for a new national identity. So they financed these um, programs that were meant to be educational and cultural. And so from the 1920s all the way through the mid-century, um, artists were paid to decorate schools and government buildings and churches and museums with these huge mural cycles that had subjects about ancient and modern day Mexico as a way of creating this new kind of nationalism. So like we saw when we looked at regionalism in the United States, these were artists who were sort of turning away from European modernism and turning towards art that was much more indigenous and local and also had a very big um, social dimension to it. So this was a period that was known as the Mexican Renaissance and it was incredibly influential not only in Latin America but also in the United States and in fact this is the first modern art movement of the Americas that has any real influence abroad. So artists were coming to Mexico to study the works of the Mexican muralists and these same mural painters were also traveling abroad, especially to the United States, where they painted mural cycles there as well. Now, it's important to understand that these are really politically motivated murals, and they were seen as being um, for the people. So we think about this, uh, most of these artists were committed sort of Marxists, um, and the idea was that murals couldn't, they weren't commercial objects. They couldn't be bought or sold. They were made for, for places and they were, they were public places. In other words, this was meant to be art that was for the people. So mural painting is what these were meant to be. These large, we talk about mural paintings, the term mural just meaning of the wall. So one of the artists we're going to look at today, Orozco, actually said, he said, the highest, the most logical, the purest form of painting is the mural. It is, too, the most disinterested form, for it cannot be made a matter of private gain. It cannot be hidden away for the benefit of a certain privileged few. It is for the people all people. Now, as I said, in America, they were aware of this. And remember that we talked about the way that the federal government in the United States was also sponsoring um, these sort of public work projects. And so, in fact, there was an artist, his name is George Biddle. In 1933, he wrote to FDR and he said, there is a matter which I have long considered and which someday might interest your administration. The Mexican artists have produced the greatest national school of mural painting since the Italian Renaissance. And so the art of the Mexican muralist which really began to emerge in the 1920s become very, very influential. Um, to the art that we saw in the Americas in the 1930s that were um, patronized by the federal arts projects. So this is the new movement that emerges. Um, it was meant to be patriotic. Um, there was no sort of fully formed theory about these, these artworks. So there's not um, a there's not sort of like an agenda written out by the artists or some sort of manifesto, although there were manifestos, but none which sort of united the artists that we're going to be talking about today. And there are three artists 
um, which are the most important that we're considering. And they are Diego Rivera, Jose Clemente Orozco, and David Alfaro Siqueiros. Um, we're going to really just look at one work or one series of works. You'll see why when I show them to you. These men, by the way, were given the title of Los Tres Grandes or the, the Three Great Ones. Um, they are all very different stylistically, but all of them were intellectuals and all of them were interested in Marxist theories. Um, so we're going to look, and I say we're going to look at one work by each, you're going to see that when we talk about one work, we're going to be looking at mural cycles, which often have dozens of pictures in them. So these were artists who are painting on an epic scale. Now let me just say one thing, because um, we talk about the fact that well, one quote said this was the sort of greatest school of painting since the Italian Renaissance. These were artists who were also working in the medium of fresco which is a very old-fashioned medium going back you know to antiquity but it was very very popular in the italian renaissance it's a technique where the artists are painting on a freshly plastered wall so normally we talk about painting we talk about painting on canvas usually or on wood panel um, and we talk about pigments and paint Paint is, is pigments, these ground minerals that are mixed with something to turn them into paint. So we have tempera paint, we have oil paint, um, we have uh, acrylic paint. In this case, um, in fresco, the artist is painting on a plaster wall that is freshly plastered with a very thin coat of plaster called the intonico. And the artist paints on this damp plaster while it is still damp with pigments in water. So it's a water-based pigment. So what happens is as that thin layer of plaster dries over the course of six to eight hours, it absorbs the water-based pigments into the plaster. And when it dries, the paint is embedded in the plaster and is chemically like stone. So it's a very old-fashioned medium the artists were using. Um, it was also one that was incredibly practical for covering really large areas of walls. It's what I would say is a flexible medium, and by that I don't mean it bends because it's like rock. I mean that, you know, it can do a lot of stuff. Fresco can be because you can spread plaster on curved surfaces and irregular walls. It's much easier in a way to paint in fresco than to paint um, on canvas and then have to mount them on the walls. Um, fresco not only looked back to the tradition of the Italian Renaissance, but it's also important to notice that um, fresco was seen as something that was also inherently Mexican. You know, that there was a, a tradition of a very similar sort of fresco technique um, painting in on a wet plaster wall with water-based pigments that were at the pre-Columbian sites of Teotihuacan. So in other words, they weren't just looking back to the European past, but the artists could say that they were taking this tradition from the indigenous past of Mexico as well. Now, probably the most famous of these artists was Diego Rivera. Um, who trained in Mexico City, but he also studied and lived in Europe for a long period of time between 1907 and 1921, which really means in essence he missed the Mexican Revolution entirely, and it was something that he then only really experienced secondhand. While he was in Paris, um, he got to know a lot of the avant-garde artists there, including Pablo Picasso, and in fact by 1913 his artist, his art had a very sort of cubist style to it as well. But when he returned to the United States, he became very interested in sort of creating a national style that was for Mexico. And so he rejects cubism and sort of avant-garde modernism and returns towards a style that's very simple in terms of its forms um, with very bold areas of color. In terms of politics, he was a committed communist and he had political statements in his art that sometimes got him in trouble. Like all of Los Tres Grandes, he worked in the United States 
um, and received commissions there. But very famously in 1931, he was hired to paint a mural for Rockefeller Center in New York City, but he got in trouble because he included in this wall scene um, of people who were like the, you know, the great achievers of humanity, he included the Soviet leader Lenin in it. And because of that, um, the image was actually destroyed. So we're going to take a look at one of his most famous and ambitious fresco cycles, which is his scene of the history of Mexico. Now you can see why it's difficult to talk about many, many works of art by these artists, because they are incredibly complex. So this is Diego Rivera's History of Mexico, which he painted in a six year period between 1929 and 1935. And it was commissioned to fit into a pre-existing space of the National Palace in Mexico City. So this is um, on a staircase, the main staircase, which is leading to the second floor of the courtyard, which has um, government offices in it and in fact it still does um, it is a space as you can see because it's on a staircase it's a double staircase so you come up in the middle and then you can walk left or right and so here this is a photograph taken from the second story landing looking down i'm going to post by the way on on our moodle page um, the the google maps link so you can actually go to this space virtually and spin around and you can see how it's situated there but you have to realize that it is a um it's a scene that you see while you're walking and so it's meant to be experiential um and so again when when you come to the second story and you story and you look back it's like looking back throughout history so as i said this was commissioned by um, the Mexican government and it was uh, as the title says it's about this history of Mexico from early native Aztec times all the way through a sort of future present Mexico so it covers things like the Spanish conquest the colonial period the independence movement the revolution the 1920s and the 1930s all the way as we said, to its present day. Um, in terms of its style, you can see that it is overwhelming. <laughs> it's an abundant kind of style. It has tons of historical portraits. Um, even though there's a couple moments of landscape, a lot of the imagery is pressed into very shallow spaces. And it's not very clear where you should be looking. So there's not really a focal point. And so that sort of forces you as you move through the space already to then participate in the narrative as you look at the scenes, which are, by the way, not presented in a chronological order. So the style is not very illusionistic. It's not very flat. I mean, sorry, it is very flat in terms of how it's presented. Um, this was a big deal when it was commissioned because this is an incredibly prestigious location in the in the government palace. Um, this was a palace with a lot of history and actually the scenes that are represented on the walls very much relate to the history of the site. The National Palace was actually built atop old Aztec ruins of an emperor's palace. Um, and it was also um, on the site of the palace used by the Spanish um, conquistadors. So this was really the site of the government from the ancient past through the sort of you know 16th 17th 18th century world and up until present day so when this was commissioned um, for this kind of state this was the the beginning of the government sort of really recognizing the mexican mural movement so we're going to look at the the scheme overall and we'll look in detail at a scene or two there's a there's more here than I could possibly do, but we're going to look just so you understand um, the earliest scene is on the right hand wall in this image, which is the scene of the sort of um, Aztec world, the sort of pre imperialist pre colonial world of Mexico. 
on the left hand wall is sort of modern day and post modern day future day Mexico is on the left is on the left hand wall. And then you could see that the wall where most of the scenes are is sort of architecturally divided by a series of five arches which segment the fresco quite a bit. And I'll show you what scenes are shown in each specific archway and how they're all linked together. The earliest scene chronologically in the cycle is on the right hand wall heading up the stairs, which shows a scene of pre Columbian Mexico dominated by the legendary god king Quetzalcoatl, who is the figure that we see on the central axis of this blonde, fair skinned god um, seated here in the center being offered a drink. Um, by a sort of ceremonial drink by the figures gathered around him. Quetzalcoatl is looked as um, a figure who brought culture and civilization and learning to the indigenous people of Mexico. His name literally means feathered serpent and he is sort of treated almost like a historical ruler of a lost city but also a god and he is these things combined. So we see the world here of this um, early Mexican civilization. We're, you can see that we're set in the valley of Mexico um, with the pyramid um, right behind Quetzalcoatl and then the scene is divided on the central axis into two halves. If you look to the right hand side of the scene over here, we see scenes that show the civilization that Quetzalcoatl has brought. We see the crops of maize being grown and figures doing a ritual or ceremonial dance to help its growth. We see figures making cloth and making pottery and basket weaving. Um, we see figures sculpting so this is this world of um, culture and learning and craft. Then as we look towards the right, sorry, the left hand side, which is to the right of Quetzalcoatl, we see the sort of Aztec world and it's dominated by figures here who were bringing tributes to an Aztec ruler and an Aztec warrior. Um, while another figure puts his hands out maybe to protest this. And then we see down below um, figures in combat. It's a class warfare that we see because we see two different kinds of figures. Um, the warriors of the culture and the slaves in the cultures locked in battle. Up above, beyond Quetzalcoatl, we see two separate images. On the left hand side, there's a volcano out of which emerges this sort of um, fiery serpent, which is a symbol for Quetzalcoatl and his sort of rebirth and birth. Um, Quetzalcoatl's birthday was celebrated every 52 years on the Aztec calendar. So that suggests it is sort of like a new era that's being opened out as we see that God emerge from the volcano. And on the right hand side, we see Quetzalcoatl who is flying away on this serpent like figure. The story of Quetzalcoatl says that he was eventually, ex even though he was the bringer of culture and civilization and learning, he was eventually expelled by his people. Um, and vows to return. And we'll see more about that when we look at Orozco's cycle. But here you see the departure of Quetzalcoatl up in the top right hand side. Now this scene, by the way, and all of the others in the cycle are painted in what we call buon fresco. So I put that turn up there, buon fresco. So fresco is what we've already talked about, which is that technique of painting with water-based pigments on a damp plaster wall. Fresco literally means fresh or wet, um, and buon means true. So when something's painted in buon fresco, it means it's in true fresco. That really just means that the artist is painting primarily on wet plaster. 
Um, once the wall dries, the artist might go back and make additions to the scene because fresco, you have to paint pretty quickly and decisively because the paint dries and as the, as, I'm sorry, the plaster dries and as the plaster dries, it absorbs water less and the paint less. Um, so you might go back as an artist when the wall was dry to make revisions or changes or additions. Um, and we call that secco, which literally means dry. So fresco means wet. Buon fresco is painting on a damp plaster wall. Um, secco, S-E-C-C-O, means painting on a dry plaster wall. So when we say this is buon fresco, it means he's really using a true fresco technique. Now on the central or west wall, which is right at sort of the top of the first staircase then the landing, um, are, is the, the bulk of the series. So on the right hand wall is when we see the sort of pre-Columbian or that Aztec world with Quetzalcoatl. On the left hand wall, we see present and future Mexico. So the bulk of the history of Mexico takes place on the west wall underneath these five connected arches. Now, you see I've given you a little bit of a diagram to show you what the scenes represent. Um, the major arches themselves represent five separate moments in history. So it begins, if you see, um, just considering the arches with the Mexican-American War when Mexico was occupied by the United States in the right-hand arch. Then we can see um, the rule of uh, Benito Juarez, who was the first president of Mexico of indigenous origin. Uh, it was a liberal democratic regime and a lot of its policies really look towards um, the revolution in the early 20th century. Um, so we see Juarez's regime here. Then we jump all the way to the left hand side. So we see this is not running in any sort of strict chronological order. And we see the overlapping period of the French occupation of Mexico. Um, the, you can see it overlaps with the reign of Benito Juarez and Juarez was um, exiled um, during part of the French occupation. Then we come to the period of the dictatorship of Porfirio Diaz, right, which you can see is called the Por Porfirian era. Um, and this is a more modern age. We can see oil drilling rigs in the background. Um, and we can see actually we'll look at some of the religious scenes in the foreground as well. So this was an age of sort of a dictatorship. And then finally, um, we move towards the central sort of section. So the very bottom of the fresco, sort of running sort of across um, all the bottom of most of the scenes, is actually the earliest scene then, going back to the Spanish conquest of 1521. So there's about 30 figures um, from both sides. So the native population fighting with the Spanish conquistadors tangling in this very close hand-to-hand -hand combat um, in, in the bottom. And then rising up towards the center, we can see um, the period of the independence of 1810. And then at the apex of the very center, we get the Mexican Revolution, which was the most modern of the events. Um, from 1910 to 1920. So it really is that central section that is core to Rivera's message about the history of Mexico. Now the final scene within this cycle is actually all the way on the left hand wall, which I'm showing you sort of obliquely here, but it's nice to look at for context, which was actually painted last after um, Rivera made a trip to the United States and then finally returned to Mexico. And it sort of shows this modern day world, um, which shows the Mexican working class making its way into Mexican history. And it is the idea that Mexico could return to the sort of golden age that was represented in the very first panel.
And if you think about it this way, these are the prologue and epilogue, the sort of bookends to the series um, on the right and left wall that we've been looking at. And you can see that the compositions are similar in this sort of hierarchic arrangement. In other words, they show what is important by placement. And so we had seen the Mexican, that early sort of pre-Columbian scene with Quetzalcoatl on the right hand side. And on the left hand image, which is the one of sort of um, present and future Mexico, we see that the primary scene is, figure at the top is actually Karl Marx. And a lot of the figures represent um, communism and the workers movement, which again fits very much with the politics of um, Rivera. So those two figures are supposed to mirror each other and these two sides of the scene, despite their sometimes negative connotations, there are negative things included in both scenes, are supposed to represent um, these sorts of golden ages. Just as an interesting note, um, in the scene on the left-hand wall of present and future Mexico, um, is a woman right on the central axis who you see here and you can see here in the larger fresco and um, that is Frida Kahlo who is the very famous painter and she was more than once Diego Rivera's wife and we'll talk about her a little bit later. And I'm just zooming in here a little on the central portion of those center three arches so that you can see more clearly because it is really this cacophony of figures which really flattens the space and turns it all into a figural pattern. But as I said, that central axis, um, the vertical space under that central arch really does have some important themes. So for example, you remember at the very bottom of the scene, we see the battles between the conquistadors and the Aztecs in 1521. And this really is supposed to represent um, the resistance to colonial subjugation that begins with the arrival of the Spanish for the very first time. But that's a theme continued throughout all of these five arches. So we see Cortez armored in the center with his spear, and we see um, the last Aztec ruler here with a, a sling in his hand, swinging it wildly. Behind them, an Aztec disc, which is a calendar. Right above on the central axis, we see this golden eagle, um, which is a symbol that is associated with the Aztecs. It's got a serpent in its mouth. Um, so it was an Aztec symbol, um, but it was also a symbol that became part of the Mexican flag. And so this really is um, the symbolic national heart Right, it really is the image of Mexico for this scene. And then if we move up further, we see two separate moments of revolution, one from the 19th century, and then a movement at the very top, right? This is the Mexican revolution that we talked about, the civil war between 1910 and 1920. You can see um, a standard or a flag being held by one of the figures that says Tierra y Libertad, um, meaning land and freedom. So it's meant to show the um, revolt of the peasants um, against the ruling class. So you can also see, by the way, in the difference between religion being represented in this scene on the two arches, the one representing Juarez's reign and the other one, um, the reign of um, um, Diaz, right? Um, Porfirio Diaz. Um, here you can see under Juarez, we've got the arrival of the Franciscan mercenaries and the monks you can see here who are tending to the people who kneel down before them. The background is the church. There you can see Juarez himself. Whereas if you look under the dictatorship of uh, Porfirio Diaz, 
Um, this is where we see the industrial background rather than the background of the church's dome. And we see religion turned into something horrific. Um, we see this age of spiritual terror. Um, we see the enslavement of the indigenous population. And we see the age of the Inquisition where people are brought before the clergy for, for tr harsh trials and punishments. So it is a damning scene. I mean, this is so interesting. It's in a government hall to talk about government themes. And here it is showing this history of subjugation and resistance, which then really becomes a metaphor for modern day Mexico. Now, one of the most interesting Los Tres Grandes is Jose Clemente Orozco. Um, he was actually the first of the three artists to actually come to America and make his mark here. But like the other two, like Rivera and Siqueiros, he received his training in Mexico City, um, an academic training. It was called the Academy of San Carlos. Um, he originally comes to the United States um, very early when he's still a young man, um, but does not have any sort of real luck. He worked as a sign painter in San Francisco. He painted dolls faces in New York, but then he ends up going back to Mexico in 1920 and working as a newspaper cartoonist. Then he ends up moving back to the United States in 1927, and he stays for a period of seven years, during which time he gains these important fresco commissions, and we're going to look at one of those. Um, his style is more expressionistic than we might say for Rivera. Um, we, in other words, you're going to see a little bit of a style that maybe has something more in common with the German expressionists like Max Beckmann, though we don't have any reason to think that he knew his work. Um, interesting fact about Orozco is that he lost his left hand when he was a young man and was experimenting with dynamite and explosives for a fireworks display. Now, what we're going to focus on for Orozco is his series of paintings that he does for Baker Library, which was a newly constructed building at Dartmouth College in New Hampshire. So again, these the Mexican muralists were painting in Mexico, but they also had commissions in the United States. And this was one of several that Orozco did. Um, it is, however, hmm, it's, it's a much more pessimistic view of civilization than what Rivera gives us, although they have a similar scope in a way. Neither one of them is strictly chronological. And Orozco um, is going to do something similar in looking back on Aztec and pre-Columbian times and the myth of Quetzalcoatl and then moving forward to modern day um, Mexico. So they're both going to have that similar idea of covering sort of Mexican history. Now the Dartmouth series is pretty large series. There are 14 large panels all done in one fresco. Um, each one of these large panels is about 10 by 13 feet. So it's like large, like a large tapestry. Um, and then there are 10 smaller scenes as well. So it's 24 separate scenes in all. Now, how did Orozco end up doing this at Dartmouth? Well, the thing is Dartmouth was very, very interested in Orozco. And the faculty and the administration had been working very hard in the early years of the 1930s to bring Orozco to Dartmouth. So for example, during these years, um, they held three exhibition of his works, his easel paintings, his graphic works, his mural studies, and they ended up um, creating a sort of visiting professorship for him so that he could come join the faculty while he worked on this mural cycle. That was funded in no small part by, Rock, by the Rockefeller family. 
um, Nelson Rockefeller was studying at Dartmouth in 1930. So it was actually um, a special Rockefeller teaching fund that made it possible to bring Orozco there um, first to do demonstrations of his fresco painting technique for the students and then he ends up um, becoming part of the faculty temporarily and his salary was underwritten by the Rockefellers. Um, when Orozco saw the space of Baker Library, which again, it was a newly constructed building on campus, he was incredibly excited. The walls were about 150 feet in length. So the room that gets painted is the reserve room of the library. So Orozco had actually seen this space when he visited the school prior to his arrival for this teaching appointment. And he ended up saying, he said, these are the walls for my best mural, my epic of America. So he saw these walls, which were, you know, 3000 square feet of unadorned space. And he said that they were the walls of his dreams. And so Orozco is very excited with this conception um, to paint the development of civilization in America is his theme. Now, interestingly, you'd say, we'll paint the development of America, and you're thinking about a college in New Hampshire, and you're thinking it's going to be like Jamestown and Pilgrims. But instead, he imagines um, this view of America as being two cultural currents in America. Orozco said this, the American continental races are now becoming aware of their own personality as it merges the two cultural currents, the indigenous and the European. The great American myth of Quetzalcoatl is a living one, embracing both elements and pointing clearly by its prophetic nature to the responsibility shared equally by the two Americas of creating here an authentic American civilization. So we're going to go back to the story again of Quetzalcoatl and and Orozco thought that that was relevant, interestingly, for Dartmouth College in New Hampshire. Um, first of all, he saw Dartmouth as being a great example of sort of liberalism in North America, even though it was also a site of white um, Anglo-Saxon privilege in terms of education. But the truth is that Dartmouth was founded in the late 18th century um, with the idea that it was going to provide an education um, to the North American native indigenous population. And so there is this idea of the indigenous ancestry of um, Dartmouth. And so he plays on that with his scene. Now, the story is not narrative and it's not really chronological. And Orozco talked about that, too. He said, in every painting, as in any other work, there is always an idea, never a story. The important point regarding the frescoes of Baker Library is not only the quality of the idea that initiates and organizes the whole structure, it is also the fact that it is an American idea developed into American forms, American feeling, and a consequence into an American style. Um, that is very interesting because we've talked about um, that, talking about regionalism with our last week, you know, this idea of creating an American subject and an American style. And Orozco saw the frescoes that he does at Dartmouth in the very same way. Now here you can see a diagram, a sort of schematic map of Baker Library and where the frescoes sit on the walls. And so, of course, when we talk about the history of America, let me just reiterate that Orozco didn't see um, America as being the United States of America. He saw the history of America as being hemispheric. So here he's considering um, North and Latin America together. Now, here you can see the long space of the reading room. It's a big, long, rectangular space with, again, these big, empty, uninterrupted walls, which is why Orozco got so excited. If you divide the room down the middle, and this is the 
the reference desk, right, um, that's here, then you can see the two separate halves um, or the reserve desk, right? So on one side, we can see um, America's sort of pre-Columbian civilization, which is on the sort of western side of the building. And then starting down the center, moving towards the eastern side, we can see post-Cortez America. So this is starting with this Spanish invasion, um, occupation, and then moving forward through history, moving towards more his, um, contemporary times. But it shows this idea of the sort of endless struggle against um, occupation. Um, on the opposite wall, there's a small sort of separated series of scenes um, which show scenes of modern industrial man. And this is sort of meant to be an epilogue, a sort of conclusion to the scene, although it's a little ambiguous in terms of its meaning. So we're going to look at a few scenes beginning over here at the earliest moments of this is the, these right starting here are the earliest moments of these pre-Columbian scenes. And then we'll look at several of the scenes as they arc around this side, which are the post-Cortez scenes. Now you can see here one of the earliest scenes in the cycle. This is the third panel, which is called Ancient Human Sacrifice. Um, this scene shows us masked figures, sort of made anonymous figures, who are shown removing the heart of a living enemy warrior, right, which is what we can see here. Behind we see um, sort of a, a deity um, of the Aztec civilization, sort of the Aztec god of war is this amorphous shape behind the scene. He's got human hearts gathered around his necklace and then we see the body of the warrior down below being restrained um, this is an idea the subject matter is about um, the destruction of human life which is seen as a way of upholding the institutional needs of a civilization and that's going to be a theme that is going to be important as we move to the later scenes in the cycle and you'll see how this scene comes back in terms of style, um, it is very expressionistic. We've got these fiery colors. We've got these long, expressive, very visible brush strokes, right? This sort of very flat areas of two-dimensional color. Um, so again, this is why this was very much related to the German expressionists. But okay, this is part of the earliest scenes, and we're going to see how we come back to this later on. Shortly thereafter, on the wall in the fifth panel, we're still looking at the pre-Columbian age, but we see the arrival of Quetzalcoatl. So again, that deity is very important to the murals, not only for Rivera, but also for Orozco. Um, he is the deity who bans um, human sacrifice and brings cultivation and civilization. So we see him here, much like um, the sort of bearded white robed God who is emerging between the architectural monuments, the pyramids of Teotihuacan, um, one of them being the pyramid of the sun and the other one being the pyramid of the moon. So that's another way of showing um, his power. He's seen a um, uh, Quetzalcoatl seeing as a sort of unifying God, unifying air and land here, the sun and the moon. Um, and then we can see him dispelling evil forces and other malevolent gods that surround him. At the bottom of the scene, we see the sort of civilizing force of Quetzalcoatl's reign. We see the interests in things like um, science and the arts, and we'll see scenes as we continue down the wall also of agriculture. Uh, now, this is not strictly chronological or historical. Um, so, for example, um, this 
era of Quetzalcoatl is often associated with Teotihuacan, which is what we see um, referenced in the buildings here. Those are specific buildings that are being referenced. Um, so we see cultures of Teotihuacan, the Mayan culture, the, the um, Toltec culture, and in fact, those were earlier than the Aztecs who are presented as sort of this uncivilized, um, early primitive reign of human sacrifice. So the chronology is off, um, but that's not really what Orozco's interest is here. Now, after the scene we saw last, Quetzalcoatl ends up being banished by his people and he ends up prophesying, prophesying his return, where he would avenge himself and destroy the civilization that rejected him. So as we then move towards the eastern wing, the eastern side of the wall, we get to the sort of post-conquest part of civilization, beginning with the portrait of the 16th century Spanish invasion of Mexico led by Hernan Cortez which is what we see here. So Cortez is sort of presented as an anti-hero, this bearded anti-hero, fulfilling the story of Quetzalcoatl and the story of Quetzalcoatl's return to avenge himself. I mean, the fact was that the um, some of the indigenous people thought that Cortez was Quetzalcoatl returned. Um, until they saw his greed and his brutality, and then they thought otherwise. But he's seen here as fulfilling a prophecy. He showed fully armored and sort of machine-like, um, with this very detached expression on his face, which does not really recognize or respond to the suffering that he sees around him. He's accompanied by a missionary carrying a cross, which is going to be sort of the um, ideological support for the invaders. And then in the very background, we see burning ships. And this is a reference to the, the sort of determined nature of Cortez, who ends up burning his own ships so that his people would not leave Mexico. So this is the beginning of occupation and brutality in this very negative image that we see of Orozco's view of American civilization. A little bit further down the wall, we see the results of this invasion of Mexico. And here I'm showing you two scenes which I've sort of inartfully mashed together, which is the scene of Anglo-America next to the scene of Hispano-America. So we can begin on the 13th panel, which is on the left-hand side, which is the scene of Anglo-America. And the, this is the scene of the world post-occupation. And we can see both the positive and the negatives in this world. So for example, the scene mostly is dominated by this um, figure of a school marm, like the school teacher in this tall figure in this blue dress, and we see a school building behind her in the distance. And then in the center part of this scene, behind her to her right, we see figures um, engaged at sort of a town council meeting, sort of like a board meeting of sorts. So we can look at these things as being remarkably positive. You know, the schoolhouse is the symbol of the interest in universal education, and the town meeting shows the interest in sort of democracy and, you know, communal decision making. And at the same time, though, we see the critique of these worlds. Um, that figure of the teacher, she is very stern faced. She's an agent of control. The children who stand around her have no expression. They're completely regimented and controlled. And they're sort of just grouped orderly around their teacher sort of staring into her legs. And likewise, there's meant to be this parallel with the scene that we see behind where we see these adult figures who are arranged in strict rows um, in this very sort of motionless way. Those male figures in the hats are a lot like the children, just sort of staring into nothingness. 
And so we can see both here the positive aspects of the goals of um, Anglo-American society as well as its defects. And this is set as a counterpart to the scene that's immediately to its side, which is the 14th panel showing Hispanic America. And now in both cases, the scenes is dominated by a single standing figure. But the figures that stand around now, rather than being incredibly overly ordered, orderly, the way we saw in Anglo-America, here we have this figure of violence and chaos. So we see um, figures of um, politicians, generals, people stabbing, literally stabbing each other in the back, hoarding money, right? So we have all of this sort of rebellious activity, greed, um, people who are willing to loot their own country for their own gain. And then on the very central axis of all of this, we have um, a rebel figure. It's probably meant to be Emiliano Zapata, who's shown as this personification of Latin American idealism. So the idea is that he is the single armed rebellious peasant figure, right? This sort of symbol for the might of the people against power and against corrupt power. Um, Orozco talked about this image. He said, the best representation of Hispanic American idealism um, as an abstract, not as an abstract idea, but as an accomplished fact would be, I think, the figure of a rebel. After the destruction of the armed revolution, whether against a foreign ambassador or local exploiter or dictator, there remains a triumphant idea with the chance of realization. If there's any need for expressing in just one sentence the highest ideal of the Hispanic American hero, it would be as follows, justice, whatever the cost. And so that's what we see here. So these two very separate sides of life, this pale skinned blonde woman versus this dark skinned um, rebel that we see on the right hand side. Now in Orozco's view of social critique, interesting that this is for Dartmouth's library, this is a university library, he critiques the modern state of education. Um, here we see education as this nightmarish scene um, where we see a skeleton laying on a bed of books giving birth to a fetus, a dead fetus, a skeleton fetus. Um, you could see others of these um, stillborn babies in jars while this academic group, which are all skeletons dressed in academic formal robes, stand and watch. <laughs> could you imagine what people thought about Orozco when he put this up? Ah, it's wonderful. But what he was talking about, well, Dartmouth said that education needed to be about relating what people learn to the outside world. And here Orozco is taking aim at the sort of idea of the ivory tower. You know, that when academics just, they um, pursue knowledge for the sake of knowledge without any need to apply it to anything external, which makes people be isolated and self-important. And that is what he is poking fun at and critiquing here, this idea of false knowledge and feudal learning. And, you know, all this big pile of books and this figure giving birth to something that is dead um, because it's dead minds concentrating on dead things. And Orozco doesn't just critique contemporary education. He also critiques um, the interest in modern civilizations and the rise of nationalism. So here we see the scene of um, modern human sacrifice, where we see the body of an unknown soldier still dressed in his military uniform, but made anonymous 
um, by this flag that covers his face. And the flag itself is a conglomeration of various national flags all mashed together. And surrounding the figures are all of the trappings of you know institutional sacrifice we see um, the monument the war memorial in the background wreaths that are laid at the tomb um, for this dead individual a candle that burns between his legs um, we can see the marching band off to the side and the figure of an orator somebody giving um, a, a funeral sermon for the dead. So it's meant to interestingly correspond to a work we've seen previously. The scene directly facing this scene of modern human sacrifice is the scene of ancient human sacrifice. So these are actually only about 50 yards away on opposing walls. And so we're supposed to see the correlation between the two. The idea that both of these are sacrifices by the institution of government for false or completely useless ends. Immediately following the modern human sacrifice scene, we have a scene called the modern migration of the spirit. And it really is the conclusion of the post-Cortez cycle, although again we saw um, there were several scenes on the opposite wall. Um, this one shows an image of this monumental figure of Christ done in a very old-fashioned, very strictly frontal style, who's shown in a type of a modern Last Judgment, where he's come to destroy what's what's happened to the world. He's knocked down his cross in condemnation of everything that he has seen done in his name. So this is about Christ um, condemning and we're supposed to condemn, which is f um, false knowledge, false power, violence and blind nationalism. So we see behind the figure of um, this figure of, of this defiant Christ, um, weapons of war, instruments of culture. We see the worlds of um, religion and um, industrialization and, and you know, um, in institutionalized education. All of this stuff is thrown onto the sort of ash heap of history behind him. Um, it's all it's all meant to be created as junk and this is the sort of fiery crescendo um, of the cycle where we see this figure destroying the old world to prepare us for what we would then call per the title the modern migration of the spirit so something that comes after which is intended as an epilogue so again we see these very expressionistic style very strong brushstroke, very acidic, bright colors. So this was, I mean, this the cycle is amazing and it shows you how complex fresco cycles are where the artist doesn't need to just consider um, one scene thematically, but to think about the space over time because that's how we experience it with this temporal quality as we move through the room. So you could see why the layout is so important to this scene. And the space is gonna be important for our next artist as well. Now, the final of the three artists of uh, Los Tres Grandes that we're gonna talk about is David Alfaro Siqueiros, who is the youngest of the three. He had a very, very academic training at the San Carlos Academy. Um, he entered there when he was just 15 years old in 1911, but it was a very antiquated, old-fashioned way of learning about art. They, you know, drew from the nude, they copied Greek plaster casts, um, so it was a very rigid kind of academic training. Uh, of course, he leaves that style when he leaves the workshop and he ends up actually being known for um, very much experimenting with materials. Um, he 
you know, tried to apply paint in all these different ways, incorporated woods and metals and sand. Um, his workshop in New York City in the 1930s is going to be instrumental for the next generation of American artists such as Jackson Pollock. Nonetheless, he was the last of Los Tres Grandes to arrive in the United States, and he executed fewer murals than the other two did in public spaces in the 1930s because of his radical political views. He was much more political than the other two, and that sometimes got, in, got him into some trouble in terms of his work. Um, but he came to the United States, United States in 1932. He said that he wanted to experience a technological civilization. And he ended up settling in Los Angeles where he taught at an art school. And that is where it takes us um, to the point of his commission for America Tropical. Now, I had said early on that there was not really a manifesto for Los Tres Grandes or for Mexican muralists. But interestingly, Siqueiros wrote a manifesto on behalf of what was called the Syndicate of Technical Workers and Sculptors. So he actually did write an artist's manifesto. And he said this, we repudiate so-called easel painting and every kind of art favored by ultra intellectual circles because it, is, because it is aristocratic. And we praise monumental art in all its forms because it is public property. We proclaim at this time of social change from a decrepit order to a new one. The creators of beauty must use their best efforts to produce ideological works for the people. Art must no longer be the expression of individual satisfaction, which it is today, but should aim to become a fighting educative art for all. So again, this idea of mural painting as the ultimate art for the people is something that Siqueiros was very interested in as well. Now, the work I want to sh show you <clears throat> is one of three um, large murals that Siqueiros painted while he was in Los Angeles teaching fresco painting at Chouinard's um, school. So this was, all, all of them were very, very political, but this was the largest and the most incendiary of the group. Um, he stayed in Los Angeles for a while, but after, let's say, about a six-month stay, um, his visa was not renewed, and he ended up leaving the country. Two other of his murals, he made three during this stay in Los Angeles, were subsequently destroyed. This one is unique in that it is still in its original location. The location, by the way, is the Plaza Art Center, and it is on a second floor exterior wall of what was called the Italian Hall. Um, it's visible from Olivera Street, which in this time was like a Mexican theme marketplace. Like this was a tourist destination. People came, they, you know, ate Mexican food and took pictures. And so he was commissioned to paint um, a subject of tropical America, right, on this exterior wall. He was asked to paint, and I quote, a continent of happy men surrounded by palm trees where fruits fell of their own volition into the arms of happy mortals. Now, Siqueiros was the most political of the three, you know, Los Tres Grandes. And so that's not what he heard. He said, it has been asked that I paint something related to tropical America, possibly thinking that this new theme would give no margin to create a work of revolutionary character. On the contrary, it seems to be that there couldn't be a better theme to use. I am pleased and I hope to demonstrate this. So you could see he felt like he was being asked very purposely to not paint something revolutionary and political, and that was exactly what he was going to do. So this scene was painted in 1932, and within about a year or two, um, a large portion of it that was visible from Olivera Street was whitewashed. Um, 
And then honestly, by the end of the decade, by the end of the 1930s, the owner of the building had the entire wall whitewashed because she said that it was ugly. So this um, painting went basically buried until the 1960s when the whitewash began to fail and the scene began to emerge through the whitewash. So when we say whitewashed, it was covered over with a white paint and the image began to come through. And so this in the 1960s was during a period where there was a really big Chicano art movement. And so a lot of attention was given towards the mural and towards preserving it. Siqueiros was still alive and he insisted that he didn't want anybody to repaint his murals. But um, groups of people sought funding in order to preserve it and it was actually a 25 year restoration project to return it to the state that we see now. And here you can see an image of Siqueiros with his scene. Now I had mentioned that he was very experimental in terms of his technique um, and he was with this as well. Siqueiros actually said in this new work we are integrally applying our new technique fresco on cement instead of painting on lime and sand, airbrushing exclusively, photographic sketches, air compressors, etc. Moreover, the fresco can be seen from three different streets. So he, unlike Rivera, who was very much interested in classical fresco technique and buon fresco technique, he was trying new techniques. So rather than using the traditional lime plaster of fresco, he was using cement. And rather than applying his paint with brushes, he was working with airbrushes. He does say something interesting here and he talks about photographic sketches and the fact that the work could be viewed from different places, which is a very interesting point. So there's a story involved here and supposedly he had a rather worthless assistant, he thought, who was supposed to be helping him on this project and he wanted to keep this assistant busy and out of his way. So he sent the assistant to photograph the mural site from as many different viewpoints as he could find. And so this assistant photographed the mural from one side street, another side street, different heights, different angles. Um, and the results were something that Siqueiros found really, really important. He said, we proved without the slightest doubt in this way that the geometric area of our mural was an active area, dynamic, an incredibly beautiful kinetic phenomenon. So having seen these photographs of all these different viewpoints looking at his work, he came to realize just how dynamic the space was. So like walking past Rivera's frescoes in the National Palace means you're walking through history and you're experiencing it in your own way, this too was supposed to be something dynamic and experiential and related to the physical space of the viewer. So this is the scene that Siqueiros paints of America Tropical. So I'm showing you two separate images here. On the top is a black and white photograph that shows you the work in its original state. Unfortunately, you can only see it in black and white. So at the bottom, I'm showing you a digital reconstruction so that you can see it probably with its original color scheme. And again, we, we've, Siqueiros was a, like Orozco, this sort of more expressionist painter. And so we see these very bright colors applied to it. Um, the scene is, of course, not what anybody expected because, again, they were expecting this lush landscape, um, something tropical, maybe senoritas, and instead we've got a scene of this curvilinear um, lush jungle scene. So we're in this sort of pre-conquest Mexico. The center of the scene is dominated by a temple which is in ruins. You could see the stones um, all laying along the foreground um, at the bottom, which suggests that what we're looking at is a ruin. 
Yet on the central axis, of course, we have something here that's very powerful. We see this indigenous figure who is crucified on a double cross or lynched. And then above him, on top of the cross, we see the image of an eagle, which is this sort of imperialist image, and it's supposed to represent the United States. So this is about um, American control and domination over this sort of colonialized Latin American world. You notice that the world of Latin America here is presented as something that was uncivilized. So there's no industrial development. That's what's being suggested by the presence of this enormous, temp enormous temple. Um, so the idea is that Latin America has not it's sort of been denied entrance into this technological world. Um, on the right hand side over this doorway, we can see two crouching figures. One of them wears a cap associated with um, Peru, like in a Peruvian style hat um, with South America, and the other one's wearing a sombrero, so associated with Latin America and with Mexico. So these figures are seen as being um, these rebellious figures who are rebelling against that imperialist image. You can see they've got guns and they're going to take aim at the eagle in the center of the figure, the center of the picture. Um, now, when um, Siqueiros talked about this image after the fact, you'll notice that he is relying on Christian imagery kind of in the same way that Orozco does, certainly very overtly. But Siqueiros didn't really think that he made the right choice in that respect. He said the only error regarding the depiction of the theme lies in the use of the cross that lends itself to an ideological conclusion. Um, the work was not entirely received favorably, and some people saw it as um, communist propaganda. I just want to now show you one single artwork by Frida Kahlo, but I'm going to post another one I'd like you to look at um, as a video link on our website. Um, and Frida is really an important painter just in terms of her personal life and I don't I feel like we always we talk about female artists we emphasize their personal lives but her biography really has a lot to do with the images that she created um, she was very much associated with the Mexican muralists um, she was actually introduced to Diego Rivera by an Italian photographer who was also part, part of this a Mexican Renaissance um, named Tina Madotti, and um, she, Frida, was then introduced to Diego Rivera, and she ends up marrying Rivera. They divorce, they marry again. It was a very troubled relationship. They shared a lot in terms of politics, that they were both of them were communists, they were both interested in the sort of national identity of Mexico. But whereas um, Rivera was working on these monumental scale images in these large murals, she really never was. She worked on a much more intimate scale and most of her work was intensely autobiographical. So it's, she suffered a lot physically during her lifetime. She had polio as a child. And then in 1925, when she was a teenager, she was in a bus accident, which ended up crushing her spine and her pelvis and her foot. So during the course of her life, she had 32 separate operations. Um, and it eventually led her, led to the amputation of her right leg. And she ended up turning to drugs and alcohol. And so she died at a fairly young age when she was still in her later 40s. Um, now, she does get adopted by various movements. So we very much associate her with Latin American modernism, but she was also sort of adopted 
by the Surrealists, and we're going to talk about Surrealism, but André Breton, who's a major figure in Surrealism, came to visit Kahlo and Rivera in Mexico in 1938, and he claimed Frida as a self-invented Surrealist, and he actually arranged to have her work shown in New York, and he actually also got um, a show for her in Paris in 1939 with the help of Duchamp. So she was sort of adopted as a surrealist, even though she was not really part of this surrealist circle. Um, she said that these works were not surreals, that her pictures weren't dreams. They instead were her own reality. So she paints maybe 200 pictures, probably a little bit less, and the majority of them are self-portraits. So there's the sort of catch-22. I don't like that we spend so much time talking about her biography as a way of explaining her art, but her art really is autobiographical. So I'm just showing you one of her um, self-portraits, there are so many and they are intensely interesting. You could see stylistically how she relates to um, the Mexican muralists with these bold areas of color, this very compressed space, which you can see here. And this is her self-portrait with thorn necklace. And this was done, I believe, right around the time that she um, divorces um, Rivera when her marriage was in a terrible situation. And this is a fairly small work. Uh, and you could see the way that like um, Orozco and Rivera, she's borrowing the language of sort of Christian iconography as well. She's shown here on the central axis and facing straight forward, which in Christian tradition, in old Christian art, images like this were usually, a very frontal image, symmetrical like this, were usually reserved for God. And here she's using a lot of iconography. In other words, there's a lot of very personal symbolism to her, and it is playing on the idea of presenting herself as a Christian martyr. In other words, in other words somebody who suffers and and is tortured for their beliefs. And maybe here this is about her suffering as a result of the situation, not only of her physical ailments, which she suffered from her whole life, but also from the destruction of her marriage. Now, when we talk about Christian symbolism, you'll notice it's called self-portrait with thorn necklace. And so she's got this very tight, almost strangulating um, ring of thorn vines around her neck. Um, which is related to the idea of the Christian crown of thorns, which was part of Christ's martyrdom. So again, it's back to that analogy. There are two figures behind her. Behind her left shoulder, we see a black cat, which is a bad omen. And behind her right shoulder, we see a small monkey who's actually playing or pulling on the thorns, but it's causing the necklace to dig into her flesh and making her bleed. Um, it's said that the monkey might have been her pet um, that had been given to her as a gift from Rivera, but it, monkeys were also um, symbols of Satan and the devil. And so that could be the purpose of the image as well. Um, other than that, we have um, around her neck, uh, there is a, a bird, a hummingbird which is, or it's usually referred to as a hummingbird, although here it's painted entirely black. Um, there's a, a bird hung around her neck, which is probably symbolic, though it's not exactly clear of the symbolism, or it's what we call multivalent. It's got a lot of meaning. Um, it, it, the hummingbird was associated with the Aztec god of war, so might refer to her situation. Um, it's also hanging around her neck like a crucifix. Um, so it again probably comes back to this sort of Christian idea. It also, people have always noted, mirrors the shape of her eyebrows, the, those black bird wings, and so it relates it even more to her figure. Above her and in her hair, we see um, butterflies um, flying up at the top, which are usually considered to be symbols of resurrection. So all of this is painted in this very, very lush background, which usually would give a sense of fertility and life, but it's also very claustrophobic and it presses the space together. So again, it's a, it's a work that was intensely personal and most of her painting was seen as a way for her to um, deal with her own life crises and situations. In other words, this becomes something like an exorcism, that she paints her pain as a way of dealing with it.
So I'm going to leave one more very important free to work on our website for you to look at. And other than that, I'm going to leave you here.